She thumps a cane and drinks champagne She's formidable and judgmental But we can guarantee That she's a quintessential lady D But recognizes great potential What would Danbury do? Welcome to What Would Danbury Do? Your guide to Julia Quinn's Bridgerton series from A to V. This episode is brought to you by Kensington's latest paranormal rom-com from Serana de Wilde, Fairy Godmothers, Inc. Mixing fairy tale elements, banter, unique characters, and sexy romance, Serana de Wilde kicks off a new series, Fairy Godmothers, Inc., about a small town that is the epicenter of enchantment until the well of magic begins to run dry. In order to refresh and refill the well, the town's three fairy godmothers come up with a cunning plan. Remake Ever After into a premier wedding destination and watch the love and magic roll in. It should be simple. Just throw a bit of fairy dust around at those who need it most. But even the best laid plans hit hiccups along the way. Lucky's name is the biggest cosmic joke ever, so when her beloved godmothers ask her for a favor, she knows she can't say no. Her juju is already bad enough. But this favor is so heinous, so horrible, so humiliating, that maybe a lifetime of terrible luck would actually be better. Ransom has worked really hard to build a new business and reputation for himself, and while being a wedding destination would work wonders for his chocolaterie, having to pretend to marry his college girlfriend, the girl he would most like to forget, seems too much to ask, even if it is his godmother's doing the asking. Can Lucky and Ransom get over their past for a chance at a sparkly new future? You can find out by buying Fairy Godmother's Ink and its adorable cover wherever books are sold. And as always, please consider buying from your local independent bookstore. Find out more at kensingtonbooks.com. In this, the final episode of season two, we follow Violet as she grows from an eight-year-old prankster to a 17-year-old debutante to a very young bride, and eventually a widow who waltzes and walks away. More a series of vignettes than an epilogue, Violet in Bloom rounds out our reading of the Bridgertons' Happy Ever After second epilogues with what is really more of a wistful history than a romance. Don't forget you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and join the conversation using the hashtag WWDDPod. What's the math, Sarah? So in our sum up episode Adele asked how many grandchildren Violet had and she counted you counted 35 Adele according to the final family tree on Julia Quinn's website but I will also say I have what is um number dyslexia so I could have been (laughs) wrong because in the course of the story it's sort of at the end Violet is sitting there at 75 and talking about her 33 grandchildren (gasps) you know why she didn't count Amanda and Oliver (gasps) because <gasps> Adele specifically said that we're counting those children as well clearly How Violet doesn't count them dare. Violet's always been like a little bit kind of biological essentialism <laughs> but when she found out about Oliver and Amanda she's like I get two more grandchildren amazing liar or what if they're not the ones that she's not counting? What if she's not counting Francesca's children? And suddenly I'm back on board. It's purely that she keeps forgetting to count Francesca's children because she forgets to count Francesca herself. And oh, wow. <laughs> Francesca and her children are like ghosts in the family. <laughs> uh Oh, well, okay, so this is the only real history that we have of Violet. And I know that certainly her characterization has raised questions through the course of the other 16 texts that we've read about the Bridgertons. So was this, was this a more necessary story than the other second epilogues? I mean, in Julian Quinn's world, yes, because she would. She's been probably getting asked from the beginning to for her to write the romance of this couple, and it doesn't end well. So it really can't be a romance. So um, because there is no happy 
ever after because he, he can't it. Okay, see, I have feelings about that because I think that they do get a happy ever after. Yeah, I, I'm actually like, I'm very similar to you, Rudy. I think just because their happy ever after didn't last until they were 80 doesn't necessarily mean that they weren't like that the relationship wasn't a success that they weren't happy you know what i mean my feeling is julie queen just wanted to get the story done and out of the way get that checkbox ticked of she's done violet at edmund leave me alone and don't the two of them appear in the Rokesbury series in the background or something as well? Well, I don't ever remember those kind of things. Yeah, they kind of do a little bit. Um, but I think I think what you said was really interesting about whether or not we can consider their romance a happy ever after, mm. just because it only lasts until they're until he's thirty nine, which is still it's a good innings. I mean, it's still like a good, what, 15 years of a really happy marriage and eight children. And it's it's like, it's an argument I think that I have in my head an awful lot as I sort of get to the age now where my friends aren't getting married anymore. I'm starting to see the first wave of divorces. Which might Um, get expedited. (laughs) Which 2020 may have pushed along a little bit. But it is, but it's really interesting because when do we, like, when do we move a relationship from not a success to success, even if it ends eventually? Like, if somebody is together for 15 years and then they realize that that relationship isn't for them anymore, like, how can you call like a 15 year relationship a failure necessarily i get your point i guess her happy happily ever after is being surrounded by 33 bridgetons and two whatevers you know what that is that's fucking evolution in progress that's survival of the fittest man Mm -hmm. our mutual friend vasiliki has this argument with people all the time I'm probably going to paraphrase her wrong, but she talks about at the end of a romance, she fully, like, it it doesn't bother her whether that couple stays together until they die or whether they get divorced or whether, like with Violet, where her husband died quite young and then she lived, like, a lot longer. She always calls these stories a happily ever after because she's not actually thinking beyond the end of the book and mm-hmm. has gotten into yeah some very interesting discussions with people about it and has somewhat converted me to this thinking as well like I would have rather read just a romance about Violet and Edmund and then have it end with them getting married or whatever it was and then like I, I'm all right to know but realistically, like 15 years later, they will have had eight children and he will die. Like, I think, look, I think this has also been a little bit of shift in the way that romance novels have been told, or I suppose the, the structure and form of the narrative within a romance novel, because if we're talking in the early, like, if we're talking particularly in the early 2000s, where, when Julie Quinn was sort of writing the O.G. Bridgertons, you, like, the romance structure still, still included what's called the black moment. So Mm. the moment when everything is lost, there's no coming back from it. It's just, you know, the, 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 the biggest crash that you can have like they're absolutely thrown into the pit of despair and it looks like they're never going to come back out again. And then of course they manage. And the idea is that this couple has been through the absolute worst already so that, you know, that whatever else life throws at them, they are strong enough and their, their relationship is strong enough to survive it. Um, And I mean, that's the way that romance functioned for a really long time. And in many ways, romance, particularly commercially published romance still functions in that way. Um, if you look at sort of the purest romances, the like the Mills and Boone 
category romance style romances like that black woman is still a fundamental part of the narrative but if you look at sort of the way particularly in self-publishing um where writers are starting to play with the form or not starting to writers are well into playing with the form and exploring what can be done within a romance story there's not necessarily that that a massive dip before the happy ever after so there's I think and I think that readers understand the difference between those two stories and can still read both of those stories and get the same endorphins and sense of optimism and hope out of the stories while recognizing that one is leading towards a forever ending or at least implying a forever ending whereas the other is implying a for now ending without finding the for now or you know for this part of their life ending uh, that it doesn't come necessarily with a side of depression you know what I mean well actually so now I'm I'm starting to think about bear with me as I say this there's an argument to be made that that like pit of despair black moment is actually Edmund's death But the happily ever after continues because Violet continues to love him the rest of her life. Because they they have a fairly smooth courtship based on, like, the vignettes that we see. Like, they meet as children where he antagonizes her a little bit and then disappear out of each other's lives for, like... Nine I'm years. just going to interrupt you because I want to put a little pain into a thought of I'm really curious as to what she was going to do with that pie. And back. To- yes. Okay. Good. I I want to come back to that too. Um. <laughs> um. But yeah. So they have this like minor antagonism as an eight year old and a ten year old disappear out of each other's lives for nine years. Remade in a ballroom, where like they have a bit of like like charming conversation that then sort of starts to turn into flirting and then six months later they're married like this is an incredibly smooth easy like stress-free courtship Compared by all, all the accounts historical romance we read. Yeah. yeah so like that fraught moment is actually 15 years into their marriage when he dies and then she continues to love him for the rest of her life and i <laughs> That's my thesis. And also, if you think about, she must be looking at her children like, get your shit together, you fuckers. Well, I like that a lot as well because I think one of the things that I really love about romance and one of the things that I sort of trot out all the time when people try and denigrate it to me is that romance is not, it's not just a love story. In every romance, both, both or more of the characters that are... Um, falling in love are doing so along the lines of a a journey of personal discovery as well. Like they have to become their best selves so that they can then enter their best relationship so that they can give the best of themselves to somebody else and be vulnerable and open. And I think the way that your thesis works, works really well with Violet because um, Edmund brought out her best self and then she just kept continuing to grow and develop as a person because she'd had the strength of that relationship behind her. And because, because that relationship meant that she could not backtrack or could not sort of fall back because she had all of those children. So she had to continue to grow and strengthen and develop and become more of who she was because of that relationship. So in that sense, I think that the happy ever after, particularly for Violet, um, did continue after Edmund's death. And certainly it would have been easier if Edmund had been there to support her. And I'm going to stray perilously close to my what the Featherington moment, but there would have been a lot more sex in her life as well. But I mean, certainly her happy ever after didn't die with him necessarily. Conversely, you could say she didn't actually change at all, but on the day that, Hyacinth was born she became her best self and it just happened the other way around but yes um, a remarkable human being and mother 
when she counts all of her grandchildren. <laughs> but I mean, if you think about it, all the Bridgertons are a bit snarky. There's always an edge of mm-hmm. But did you think Edmund was Colin? I definitely thought he had some Colin esque tendencies. Yeah, Many. and then obviously Violet was Hyacinth slash Eloise. I felt more uh, Eloise than Hyacinth. She's not. She's not completely diabolical. Yeah. Well, and I mean, she's a wildflower at the when she's a debutante. Like she might have had Hyacinth tendencies when she was a when she was a child, but by the time she gets to her debutante year, like Hyacinth would never have sat in the no. in the wildflower seats. So are we to think that the only two Bridgerton girls who weren't wallflowers were, were Francesca, who's beautiful, and Hyacinth, who could be fucked, sitting with the wallflowers, so she's just a, like a free agent? It wasn't that they were wallflowers, because they definitely, they get invited to dance a lot. Like, they're, mm. they're popular. It's just that they've had, and like, I actually don't love this trope at all, but they had had a love match modelled for them and so they just weren't willing to like compromise Mm -hmm. on anything other than and so they're all I mean like the Gregory is like the most extreme example well he had eight models of it (laughs) by the time it was his turn definitely had more than that so I think what we really find out is that Julie Quinn really loves a wallflower heroine. <laughs> it's also much more of a um, everyday gal reader mm. in, you know what I mean? <laughs> like... Yeah. But that is why I'm now deeply suspicious of romance heroines who love reading Jane Austen. Like I, f- I'm just like I know what I know what that is. Like I understand the shorthand of that, but I'm like, you don't need to pander to me. It's like when um, children's book writers or like YA writers include like the friendly librarian into their books because <laughs> then they know it will sell into schools and public libraries. <laughs> And public librarians and and school librarians, I don't know, have worked out that they're being pandered to. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Uh, anyway. Well maybe they just don't care. Maybe that they get so little positive attention they'll take it. <laughs> Can I ask the question that I cut from the quiz? Yes. yes, please. In Violet's very old old years, which of the siblings does she live with when she can, when she needs constant care? It would be Daphne, surely. Like they would have the most resources too, right? And like the biggest houses and Daphne's the oldest daughter. And Adele, you and I know that the oldest daughter always gets saddled with a responsibility. You get shit done. Right? And don't expect praise. <laughs> Good, because you don't get cookies for doing your job. Kate's face when I said that, I like I'm glad we're not actually in the same room. That being yeah. said, Daphne was also the person that I thought of. Like, why would you live with Anthony when you can live with Simon? We know that Anthony and Kate's relationship is predicated on squabbling as foreplay. So, like, I get why that works for them, but you don't want to be around that all the time. I would find that really unsettling. They also have, I mean, may- maybe they don't, maybe Mary ended up remarrying but Kate has her own mother to think of as well and like he's parentless yes he is also he brought her the flowers which I think he's like the smoothest move in the series really and because like and Michael the only other one to be like as smooth if not actually smoother than Simon he's got his mother and John's mother in Scotland so Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to, if you were ever going to be in a Bridgerton sandwich, I want to be between Simon and Michael. Is it technically a Bridgerton sandwich when neither of them are Bridgertons? It's the Bassett Sterling, which sounds like a sex move. So the 
scene that was originally meant to be in an offer from a gentleman, which is the waltz with the mysterious man. I don't know what to do with that scene. Is it supposed to just say Violet can still get it even at 52? Or how threatened her children are by the notion that she could be getting some. (laughs) Or, I don't know, was it meant to shame men who like ducks? Because actually I thought it was quite charming that he had a collection of wooden ducks. I think it's to show she is attractive to people, but she's chosen not to pair off. That it is a conscious decision that she had the love of her life. She is fully fulfilled by her family and she doesn't need duck men. Adele is that she has no ducks to give. Like, maybe she's holding out for a pigeon man. Well, maybe she just has a very, like, on the side relationship with a tall footman. Yeah, look. So now we're ducks going on the side. Deeply into what the Featherington. Well, I don't have anything else to say about this, like, these vignettes. So I'm happy well, to I move to. It? Did you want to talk about the pie? Yeah. Oh. Okay. What? Okay, so I have actually spent more time thinking about this than I have about any other part of the the vignette, uh, the this series of vignettes, and that is, what was she going to do with the pie? Because the only thing that I could conceivably come up with, because there was like, she had a whole pie, and there was something about a trap, and all I can see in my head is like, one of those box traps that's up on a <laughs> stick, and then like the pie's underneath, and then like... Edmund crawls in to get the pie and then a box falls and traps him. And I'm like, this is not a good prank. This is a terrible prank. And also, what were you going to do with him once you caught him in the box in the first place? It's like Hungry Hungry Hippo, but in Regency England, but with pies. With blackberry pie. Yeah. I really, I really want to know what she was going to do with the pie. And I feel like it's unfair that... Edmund's flower bomb is like reasonably well explained. Like you kind of understand how that worked and what happened and that we don't get to sort of see Violet's physics and machinations Mm. as fully realized as Edmund's. Yeah. I blame the patriarchy. (laughs) (laughs) Cause until I remembered the word trap, I thought she was just going to throw it in his face. Oh, that'd be a waste or, of time. I know, I, yeah, look, it is, but like. And Bridgerton's wouldn't purposely ruin food. Also, I didn't like the, the thing where her dad's like, he likes you. And I'm like, this is toxic. This is toxic bullshit. And do not ever tell your daughters this. Because a guy not being able to manage his feelings so he takes them out on you in negative ways is not cute or acceptable as a romantic overture like teach your fucking sons better and don't make your daughters put up with that shit when was this written this wasn't actually written that long ago was it i i mean that's still an attitude that i like i have kids in school like school age kids and that's an attitude that i still see Oh, he likes her, so that's why he's torturing her. Not an okay reason. Especially because it happens moments after she's just, like, she has been talking to her father where he's been telling her that, like, I'm sorry to have to say it, but it's a lesson you'll learn soon enough. Boys are horrid. And then he goes on to explain that, like, yes, even he himself, he was a horrid boy, just ask your mother. She will confirm. And then, yeah. And then he just... He... And then luckily they had women to do all of the emotional labor to make them into reasonable people. Yeah. That wasn't my what the Featherington, though. That was That's just a, a side toxic bullshit thing that irritated me. My what the Featherington is the fact that Daphne's like, what, never in the, like, 50 years since Dad died? And Violet's like never and i'm like let violet have sex like <laughs> seriously 45 year dry spell that's not that okay i don't care that point. how fulfilling you find your life and your you know commitment to your children like it's okay to have an assisted orgasm in that time you can yeah. still be fulfilled still not want a marriage 
and have an assisted orgasm. Like, that's okay. That's fine. Find yourself a nice, tall footman. Find yourself a mysterious masked man who happens to like ducks. It doesn't matter. Like, just go ahead, enjoy yourself, and then move on with your satisfying, fulfilled life. Like, those two things don't have to be mutually exclusive. That irritated me. I felt really, really bad for poor Violet and her 45-year dry spell. And I was like, do they even... I know, like, every historical period in the in history has had dildos of some kind. And I'm really hoping that Violet had a discreet maid that she sent out to... Well, so we can get it done with a pillow. I mean, yeah, but... I mean, that's not preferable, but... Yes, I know that she could get it done otherwise, but I just feel like there wasn't a single time in those 45 years when she could have had a discreet affair and enjoyed the, the the trappings of having other men or a discreet widow of her own but you join can't her. Have sex without loving someone. It's not yes. disloyal. It's just pleasure. And I'm really sure that Edmund, if he loved her that much, didn't want her to go 45 years without a little bit a of good cuddling. ducking. Yeah. <laughs> or fuck, just some cuddling for heaven's sakes. Like, oh my God, that would be hard. You know? I can't really see Anthony being a, any of her kids really being cuddlers. No. It wasn't really a physical affection. Yeah, they're not a it. very tactile family. Which actually leads into my WTF. So about them, like, being, like, emotionally aware. So Hyacinth is born and Daphne says, quietly, she'll never know Papa. No, Violet said. No, she won't. No one said anything. And then Francesca, little Francesca, said, we can tell her about him. One, they never fucking talk about Edmund in anything that I can see, except for maybe one conversation between Hyacinth and Anthony. And the fucking hilarious nature of Francesca being the one saying we could talk about him when she fucked off to Scotland as fast as she could <laughs> and went incommunicado in is fucking laughable. Why would you put that in there when you know you didn't talk about him? He became person non grata except for, like, Anthony the Boob Man beefera. Like, it's just, it's just weird to me. It was so that we could all learn that Benedict was taller than Edmund. <laughs> My main what the Featherington was that I don't see why we can't have a full length novel about Violet and Edmund. Like I would read I would absolutely read that and I would probably enjoy it because I actually really enjoyed the beginning, like the first couple of vignettes. Then, I enjoyed the last one as well. I mean, yeah. I but there's something quite wistful and poignant about her sort of looking back on 75 years of life and thinking, you know what? It was worth it. It was like, that's, I, I think that's. Do you know what that was? That was the second epilogue of this epilogue. <laughs> What? Does that mean that I liked the second epilogue movie? You liked one Rudy. of them. I can't. I can't. Kate, no, I like wasn't the real like... second epilogue the friends we made <laughs> along the way? Uh, look, I, I mean, it was it was extraordinarily um, emotional and cheesy, but I think it was I think it was really nice. I really liked it. I thought it was. You know, this is the kind of thing that we should all aspire to. This is the sort of happy ending that I that I really enjoyed seeing was, you know, her reflecting on her life and outside of her relation her romantic relationship, but on the things that she had achieved and seen and the satisfaction that she had found and being like, I've led a really good life. Yep. Like I mean who should all be for- able to say that on our seventy fifth birthdays? Okay. Should we talk really quickly about one of my favorite reveals of the story? Yes. Which was the oh. fact that Edmund was also a virgin on their wedding night. How that... have we not talked about this yet? I don't know. He's only, he's 19. Like when they re in the ballroom 
So and there's a part of me shortly after. Yeah. So there's there's a part of me that is like, yeah, like it actually. There's there is a lot of logic, and it's very much his character. It's one hundred percent believable, and also he's charming enough that you could believe that he sort of talked himself around any kind of peer pressure to go and mm. visit a brothel or whatever. And I mean, like when <laughs> he's he's at a party drinking six cups of lemonade, like <laughs> this is not a wild boy. <laughs> Also, he's looking to the wallflowers. He's checking out the wallflowers. Well, he's he's looking for his friend and happens to recognise Violet because he never forgets a face. Whatever. And apparently she looks a, like her 17-year-old self looks a lot like her 8-year-old self, which I would believe. I mean, I look identical to myself from every age, so As it's does, possible. Do your children look identical <laughs> to you? Um, I think the thing is, I, I like to have the little private thought that, like, he's probably been holding a bit of a torch for her in all those years as well. He probably was a bit more conscious of it than Violet was, you know? I don't really remember people that I met when I was eight or ten, let alone so briefly. But I just, I like, I think it's very much in his character that he would be a little bit more thoughtful about who he shared intimate moments with and also I don't know even perhaps in that level be a little bit shy this says a lot about me there is um an essay that I basically always have as a tab on my phone that is by Jonathan A. Allen and it is from the Journal of Popular Romance Studies Theorizing Male Virginity in Popular Romance Novels and Allen suggests that there are, I'm fairly sure that it's four types of like male virgin heroes in romance novels. And I just want to work through what would Edmund be? I'm so here for this discussion. Because there's the sickly version. So the reason that he is a virgin is because he has been ill and has otherwise not had the opportunity. That doesn't seem to count here. There's the student version. So he's he ends up being paired with a more experienced woman and she becomes like the sexual teacher. And then obviously he learns to have sex well and so then... The most recent uh, Julia Quinn release had Georgiana Bridgerton, who I believe is Edmund's sister... And Nicholas Rokesbury, and he is a student and a virgin in that novel as well uh, because he's been studying so hard that he ain't got mm. his schwang out. Jonathan Allen would call that the genius virgin. He can think past sexual desire. Oh, but then the fourth type is the virgin as commodity. So it's like the hero of unclaimed by Courtney Milan who is like famously a virgin and so then the heroine is hired to compromise him and she will get money for doing so so it's like it's like taking his virginity as a bad type story but like better than that the Van Morrison virgin Possibly. Uh, famously a virgin and thus people and thus because you've become because you've made it so obvious it becomes a a source of power as well. Look, I don't think Edmund is any of those. That's I think pretty- Edmund honestly is more in line with what you would expect from a Regency romance heroine virgin in that he's incredibly young and he's he, you know, he he's not he he he's probably just out of school, probably not even actually. Really, he'd still be in Oxford or Cambridge or whatever, um, and sure, be running with with other sort of young arist- aristocratic men, um, but maybe haven't sort of stepped into that idea of manhood where you go to the gambling hells and you you know you go to the brothels like maybe he's still sort of teetering on the edge between boyhood and manhood um 
and thus when he meets Violet, that's when that's when he makes that step over. So he doesn't go through the normal rites of passage, but like their marriage and their relationship is both of their steps into adulthood um, mm. in a way that you wouldn't expect from an older hero. Now it's time for What Would Damry Do? This is where we imagine that a character from another favourite book has written to the cane-wielding and extremely candid Lady Danbury to ask for advice. This week, as is fitting, our letter comes from Shane Hammond of Heated Rivalry by Rachel Reed. Dear Lady Danbury, Ilya Rosanoff is a humongous dick with, you know, a humongous dick. We've always been in competition since the junior games, head to head on the rink, the best ice hockey players in the world. But there's some extra head being exchanged on the down low. We like to fuck. He was my first and I don't want anyone like I want him, but this cocky dick seems like he wants more, but that could ruin our careers. What would Danbury do? Only in Australia did they say ice hockey players. I had to clarify where we're you at. You really don't. Only in Australia. Everywhere else you would say field hockey players because ice hockey Ooh. is the default hockey. We have listeners in on both continents and I was the one writing it. So it's ice and hockey all players, of the, okay? Like all of the listeners everywhere else in the world are like, what the fuck is ice hockey? Hockey. It's hockey on ice, as opposed to on the field. <laughs> like Disney on ice, but rougher. <laughs> also, you. I'm not entirely sure that this is necessary for my answer, but just in case, what positions do they play? <laughs> oh, Jesus. I, I, that's really unfair, Kate. <laughs> They're on... The rink. <laughs> <laughs> what more do you want? <laughs> like, it's important to have, I cannot possibly make an informed answer to this question without knowing <laughs> what position. I think Lady Danbury would be like, fuck it, you only live once, drop the pads and just go for it. Noted hockey fan Lady Danbury. <laughs> 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 sometimes you just gotta go for the body check that's what i'm saying can i just say the sex scenes in this book <sighs> uh, i i really and i've actually read i think four books in the game changes series and they're all about gay ice hockey players which is fantastic um and it's not the only virgin hero in the series as well um well i i would say gay virgin hero so um might not fall into the four categories no well i I will say shane has had sex with his girlfriend but then becomes all about Ilya. (laughs) but he's bi um there is a book in the series called common goal where um a goalie from the new york team retires and basically decides it's time to be his real gay self but has he's like an old player old I do quick fingers and is you know entering the gay scene um for the first time so I think I think there's some interesting things that Rachel Reed does but Shane and Ilya have like combustible chemistry they only get together for like two hours every three months and Shane doesn't really sleep with any one really in between but he would not ever tell Ilya that and in the press they're both like having goes at each other all the time this is super big rivalry so it's sort of foreplay in some respects so Shane based on the number of dick jokes in your letter I think that you need to evaluate, before you go any further, evaluate whether you actually want a relationship with Ilya or are you content with it just being a good time? Which is fine if that's all you're after, but don't waste this boy's time if all you want is to make head-to-head jokes 
But if your feelings are more sincere than that and you're just covering this okay. insecurity with humor, which again, fine, relatable, totally get it, then like, yeah, you're going to have to, you're going to have to be brave and be a bit vulnerable. As our goddess Alicia Rye says on the regular, dick is cheap and plentiful. If the only thing you want is dick, there's easier dick to have. That's all for this season of What Would Danbury Do? We hope that you enjoyed visiting the second epilogues. We will be back in February with season three, where we dive headfirst into the fun and frivolity of Bridgerton on Netflix. See you then. If you like the show, please let us know. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at, at @bridgertonpod or send us an email at bridgertonpod at gmail.com. You can also leave us a rating or review on your favorite podcast provider. This episode was recorded on the traditional and unceded land of the Gadigal, Wurundjeri, and Boonwurrung people and edited by audio producer Rudy Bremer on Gadigal Country. Thanks for listening and remember, WWDD. What Would Danbury Do is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts.